Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I brought back Cody Watkins because we had such a great conversation last time on health and fitness. This round, I really wanted to pick his brain about metabolism and how he's helped over 2,000 people achieve better lives, lose fat, gain muscle, and get the bodies that they dreamed of. So in this episode, he's going to go into some deep detail on how he's working with clients to get success. I learned a few things and it was so inspiring, but also fascinating that we had to split it into two podcasts. So this is part one. All right, let's reintroduce you to Cody Watkins. Hey, Hell Junkies, I have Cody Watkins on again. And boy, are we gonna talk about some stuff that I get asked about all the time. So Cody, welcome to the Health Fix podcast again. Thanks for having me back. Man, last time we were cracking up and I've been cracking up on your Instagram since we talked last (laughs) because every single meme you've got on there, I'm like, yep, understand that. Yep, understand that one. So I just want to put a big old props out to you for just keeping keeping the vibe happy and hilarious on there. Well, that, that, that's what we go for, right? I like you, people take fitness too serious, and yeah, you, you got to be serious to get results, but you got to have fun while you're doing it. You know, there is that balance, right? Like you can have fun being serious about your results. I think that's what we lose in this whole thing. Everyone thinks we have to be like robots and eat like robots, and and really just uh, get in there and grind, and and it has to not be fun. And that's the same thing with medicine too. I, I feel the same way. It's like, why can't medicine be fun? We should feel better, right? The end result is feeling better. So that's not bad. It, it shouldn't be a bad time to do that, right? And so if you if you kind of enter fitness and it's leaving a bad taste in your mouth, the likelihood that you're going to stick with what you're doing ends up being very, very low in comparison. Right. Like you've, you've probably seen this, like being, being in the industry as you are, where people are like, there's kind of people who want to be like, let's put this way, killed during a workout. And they're like, they enjoy that. They're like, that is my jam. But there's other people who are like, that was the worst thing ever. (laughs) I, You know, like, I don't even know, like it's four days later and I'm still sore. I can't get out of bed. This isn't fun. Yeah. Now, of course, like what you just said, you're not going to come back to it because it's not fun. So it's like, how how do we find that that happy balance and, and joy in it? So yeah, well, you got to figure out which kind of person you are, too. So like with me, I'm, I'm so results oriented. It's not about the result of the workout, like how I feel about that. That's just information. Mm-hmm. It's it, is it getting me to the goal that I set out to get? So if I'm sore or not, it doesn't matter to me as long as I'm moving the needle towards where I'm trying to get to. Like, that's it. But people that chase the soreness, like, I mean, I can make anyone sore or you can under eat and be sore. So I don't always think that's a good thing. Um, but likewise, like you you should typically feel something. But yeah, if you're if you're like a, a trainer coach anything like that and most of your clients aren't moving for five days, you're probably not going to have a lot of uh, you're going to have a lot of turnover. We'll just say that. <laughs> well, and I mean, it's one of the questions I get from my patients a lot is like, should I be mm-hmm. sore after a workout and how long should mm-hmm. I be sore? And and when someone says like, yeah, I've been sore five days, I'm like, overdone, like by, by far. What do you yeah. tell people just in, in general, what's kind of your blanket statement in yeah. terms of soreness to get results? Yeah. Um, And like you just said, it sounds like you don't even have to be sore to get results. So I, I want to hear you kind of your yeah. spiel on that so folks can kind of hear your take on it. Yeah. So soreness is, it's a good gauge when something's different, but not necessarily in terms of results. So like if, if you were one of my clients and we started a new uh, workout regime, even if you were training five, six days a week, it's so different from what you were doing that you're probably going to feel it in places you haven't, right? Because it's a new order, a new sequence. But the thing is like maybe new with legs, we get one to two days of soreness, maybe three. If anything's beyond three, you either were undernourished going into the workout or you're overtraining or a combination of both. So you got to look at those variables. But for new people coming in, yeah, you're going to feel it if it's new. Mm-hmm. But the next week, you should feel it a little bit less. And then the week after, you probably won't even be sore. You'll be maybe tight the next day. But this is where you'll watch other variables, right? Making sure you're increasing strength, reps, uh, intensity of it, whatever uh, measurables you're watching. And that's where you're going to gauge results. So soreness is it's correlated 
but not directly. It's not linear to your progress. So yeah, it's nice to know you did something different, but it does not go hand in hand when it comes to progress. So like if you take bodybuilding, for instance, I've never had my shoulder sore training them. Wow. But it's never been that they didn't grow. And my legs are probably like my worst body part. And they've been the most sore probably of everything. So <laughs> there's there's some discrepancies there. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, I think about it and I think about the over the course of like a training block, right? You start out. Yep. There's usually some soreness. And like you said, as long as you're making progress, weights going up, you're able to lift more, you know, that's good. And yeah, you might not be sore. And I do tend to find that like sometimes when it's a new block and new exercises that first week I'll feel more. And then after that, it's like, eh, nothing. Yeah, but if you're getting crippled where it's like beyond day three, like you're either overdoing or under eating or a combination of both. So you got to look at your whole, your program as a whole and kind of see what, what variable needs to change. And this is what leads me into like one of the biggest questions I get from clients left and right is like, I'm, I've hit a plateau, nothing's working. The weight's not coming off like doc, what do I do? And a lot of times there'll be some correlation to like, I'll ask, well, what, what have you been doing for workouts? How you been doing? Oh, I've been crushing myself in the gym and I'm sore. Like, you know, I'm like, yeah. So I'm going to have you kind of give us the scoop on, you know, kind of the kind of why you don't believe in plateaus and like what's going on when it seems that nothing's working. Yeah. Tell so, us, tell us, help us, please. Plateaus. I mean, the, the best way to put it is a plateau is bullshit right now. Not saying that they can't happen, but where most people think they're at a plateau, they're not watching enough variables to have a full scope of it and or they're not watching enough inputs to know if they even are at a plateau. So my point being, a lot of people will be like, I'm stuck, I'm at a plateau, nothing's changing. And they looked at the weight Monday and they looked at the weight Wednesday. Mm. That's fantastic. Are you actually stuck? Maybe you didn't sleep as long on Wednesday, right? So the weight didn't come off. Maybe you're up early, maybe you're stressed, maybe you got some food that was bloating you. So first, define that your plateau is actually a plateau. Now, if you've been logging all your strength, logging all your workouts, logging all your food, you have good energy, good rest, good recovery, and you're sitting there for two-ish or more weeks, then yes, you may be getting stuck, but I don't like to think of it as the word plateau because it, it kind of defines no hope. It means your, your body has simply adjusted to what you're doing. It, it has adapted to what it is. And this is metabolic adaptation, which happens. So what we now have to do is we either have to increase the output, we have to decrease the input, or we have to change the stimulus in its entirety. And those, one of those, or all three of those will move that needle. Now, and also in this context, like when you're talking plateau, you got to make sure that you were doing everything that you were supposed to, right? So if you're trying to blame like a program as a whole, and maybe you weren't being so keen on nutrition, logging things a little sporadically, you're probably not at a plateau. You're probably just deviating more than you think. If you're like, no, I'm crushing my workouts. Are you? Because if we look back and, you know, maybe say you're going for like eight, 12 reps and you're getting 12 reps on everything, is that crushing it? Or maybe should you try to bump that weight up and go for eight reps, right? So maybe you didn't push the intensity of those workouts enough. So it's not that maybe the workouts are broken, but maybe how you're applying those workouts mm -hmm. is broken. Mm -hmm. Likewise, if your stress, your sleep, your gut, food allergies, those things can all factor it. But if it's to the point where it's like two weeks and you don't have any of that going on, yeah, you've got to change your approach, right? So if you're trying to run and get across the room, there was something in your way, you wouldn't just stop when there's a coffee table, right? You'd either work harder and go over it. You'd work a little longer, go around it, but you'd find a new path, right? We don't just go plateau. I'm done. This, that, that's it. It's all she wrote. So then look at it like, okay, could I perhaps switch my workouts up? Maybe a different sequence. Maybe you're only working out two or three days a week. Maybe four or five days a week would work. Maybe the intensity of the workouts, maybe the rep range of the workouts, maybe the rest time, maybe you need to do more supersets with those workouts. Maybe your calories are actually a little bit too high for your stimulus. The most common one I see though is movement decrease. So maybe you crank that cardio up as you went, getting 8,000 steps a day, but now you added 30 minutes cardio, but you're still getting 8,000 steps a day. So did you do more output or did you just exchange output from a said walking to elliptical? So really what it is, is your perception of your effort in is higher than what is actually in there. And so that's also another variable to look at, but two weeks is that switch mark. Then you switch it, right? Whether it's intensity of the workouts, 
uh, how much food you're intaking or a sequence, either switching up how many days, what you're doing those days, et cetera. And that's usually enough to get the body in its, in its movement, right? Now, if you're doing all of these things and still not getting outputs, this could be like where you touch base with a doctor and it's a hormonal problem, but I don't blame the hormones first and foremost. If anything, they slow things down. They don't stop it. So that's just another way to look at. So when I hear hooves, I think uh, horses, not zebras. So I don't, I don't look for the complicated things first. I like to make sure the program as a whole isn't working before I look much deeper when it comes to that. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that hormones will slow things, but they won't halt it because it is the number one thing that people ask me. And so they think they need more hormones or they need more of this, or they need to adjust it or detox or you name it. Right. Um, one of the things that you said that, that piques my interest is the intensity because we're constantly being told as women in particular, too much intensity is going to wear you out. And if you're already worn out, you know, you need to back down. And here's the thing. I find that most women aren't giving enough intensity, that that's actually the problem. And that's why the metabolism slows because we're not doing the intensity. So yep. I'm going to have you kind of speak to that. Yeah. And I don't think it's just women. We, we are yep. in a society now that it chastises intensity. So I remember when, you know, when I first got into lifting 15, 20 years ago, when I would go up to the gym, I would see these skinny little guys lifting way more weight than they ever should. And you'd think, wow, he's, you know, he's kind of looking like a jackass. Like this guy weighs 120. He's trying to curl a 50. Like that's bad form. But now it's the flip side, right? You have so many of these social media influencers and they're guys my size and they're curling a 10 pound weight. And they're like, you just need to focus on the squeeze. That is not going to get you your body. I promise you that these girls that you see doing 10 pound glute kickbacks, these guys that you see doing 10 pound bicep curls, none of them did that to get those amazing bodies they have. Every single one of them put the time in, lifted the weights, did it progressively heavier, and they're trying to sell you a load of fluff on what works when it's really, it's nothing, it would have never worked to get them to that body in the first place. So women, A, intensity it has to be there because you don't have as much muscle mass so you do have to put in equal amounts of work right there's no way around that you've got to push those workouts and the thing is from a from a stress cortisol all that perspective as long as the volume of your workout is not insane in comparison and your hormones like you're not at zero testosterone you're going to make progress right and you'll see it on the flip side of biomarkers right maybe if your resting heart rate's elevating your, your breathing rate tends to change a little bit. Maybe you're not recovering as well, but you'll be able to evaluate that as you go. So if you're at like a 60 resting heart rate, you kick that training intensity up. Also you're 65 to 67. Hey, body's probably not recovering ideal. So then it goes back to, Hey, do we have proper nutrition? It's maybe just not the stimulus, but in this instance, women got, you got to push, right? So if you're doing like an eight to 12 rep range, 12 is not the goal. And this is where I see most people go. They go, Okay, good. I did 50 for 12, 50 for 12, 50 for 12. Fantastic. But that tells me, Jen, that you need to do eight mm -hmm. at 55. And Jen's like, well, but I got 12. 12 is not the goal. So what we do is when we can get to 12, we try five pounds more to get at least eight. And then if we get eight, we go cool. And then we try to get nine, 10, 11, 12, whatever it is. And not just that week, maybe it's you know progressive over time. When we get to 12, we bump it up. And so say you get to 12 at 60, you go for 65, you only get six or seven. Cool. We know that it wasn't quite time to bump it up yet. So maybe we got to run that 12, you know, a little bit out of range, like 13, 14, or 15, just so we can push enough stimulus there. And then we do the leapfrog method. Power it up and do that. And we do that over time. And you're going to have more muscle before you know it. You're going to be able to whoop somebody's tail if they try to steal your purse, right? All kinds of cool stuff. So, <laughs> but you got to, you got to push the body, right? The body it's lazy. It will do no more than it has to. So if it's going up there and it's like, ah, yeah, Jan's at the gym again. So let's get ready for the 20 pounders. We've been doing these for 36 weeks. Okay, cool. It knows how to do it. So it has made that the most efficient it can. And efficiency is a fancy word for not burning as many calories. So we want inefficiencies. We want the stuff that's hard. We want the stuff that's challenging. So the body's going, oh no, I better, I better burn some calories and actually figure this out. Likewise, all back to the, the plateau thing, you can see it with cardio because people get married to a machine. And when they're married to that machine, it becomes so efficient. They're like, no, I'm doing 45 minutes on the Stairmaster. Okay, cool. Try 45 minutes on the road. 
And they're like, oh, dear God, I was 15 minutes in. I'm dying. Cool. You got 30 more to go. <laughs> now we're working, right? Or, you know, Jacob's ladder or something different so right. that, that that particular pattern is not efficient, right? And it can be as little as cranking up the resistance, going backwards on an elliptical instead of forwards. It just has to be a different different biomechanic than you're used to. And then once you do that, now it's like inefficiency the first time. Like everyone here has rode a bicycle. First time you got on a bicycle, you could not ride in a straight line. And now you can talk on your phone, pedal around, do all this stuff, right? Because that pattern's in, because it's easier to do. That first time you're probably sweating bullets just trying to drive in a straight line across your yard. <laughs> oh my God, so true, so true. And then some days on the elliptical, I can't see, the thing's connected and I can't seem to like get the sequence down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not, I'm not a fan of cardio machines, but um, all joking aside, I do tend to be shit show on them. <laughs> Oh man. Yeah. You know, that's the one thing that I think a, a lot of us just need to hear is that we need to switch things up. We need, do need to challenge the intensity sometimes is the issue. And, you know, one big thing is a, a lot of runners, right? Yeah. They'll run, they're, they're all about mileage. And I'm like, how about some speed up, slow down? How about run some backwards? You know, what do you do with runners that, that come in and lift and work with you too? Glutes and hamstrings. <laughs> so Running is, again, when a runner is good, it's because they made the motion efficient. Right. It's, it's, it's no other thing. So they're put, able to put on the miles because their, their mechanics are so good. But what they've done in the process is create a lot of muscle imbalances. So that's why you won't look at a lot of you know, distance runners and you're like, wow, she's got an amazing butt. You're like, well, she can run 12 miles. Cool. But what's weak in that chain? And so usually they get over tight hip flexors. The hamstrings get tight. They overuse their quads just from the hip the, the hip positioning. So if they come in, they start strengthening hips. They start strengthening hamstrings. They start stretching or strengthening glutes, sorry, stretching hips, strengthening hamstrings. Now they're bringing that posture back to, to a balance. Plus, you got to think from a strength perspective, if you can increase the output of a muscle, they can increase speed. So, you know, the distance between like, okay, maybe they're running at whatever, five miles an hour. But if running gets easier, they could run 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, no problem, because now they have the actual muscle strength to do so. So now they can cover more distance in less time just by becoming more efficient with the actual mechanics of what's firing up in that motion. They're not fighting in imbalance. Everything's flowing. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And you don't have a flat butt. So that's a plus too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, no, it's definitely having the glute strength is huge. I mean, it, ultimately, if we look at it, a lot of people might be like, well, I like my flat butt. Well, do you like the idea of getting up off of a toilet? Because that is the thing as we get older, as we need to be thinking, right? Like, how can I keep myself out of assisted living? How can I keep myself in my house longer? Flat butts won't get you there. Yep. Gotta have the glute strength to get you off the floor. Mm -hmm. There yep. you go. Yeah. I don't want to be pressing that button. I fall and I can't get up. That yeah. <laughs> the life alert but dependent. <laughs> I, I do not. Well, want there's to... a, there's a. I forget the the city over in Japan, but it has an average of the highest average of hundred plus year olds living there. But if you look at the Japanese culture, they don't use chairs. They don't sit, and like they don't have traditional toilets. It's literally a hole in the floor. So this 100 plus year old person that would not be able to not be in assisted living here in the United States, they're moving themselves up and down all day because they've done that their entire life. So they sit down, they got to get up completely off the floor. They have to go to the bathroom. They have to do a full squat, heels to glutes, right? All day. And so it's that saying, use it or lose it. So, you know, if anyone knows anyone that's retired, you will see this every time. If they retire and don't do anything, they age 10 times as quick as someone who stays doing something, that's why you'll see a lot of successful people retire and then go back to work, not because they need the money, but because they can feel themselves slipping away from a purpose, a goal and all that. And they just begin to age rather rapidly in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've seen, I, you know, I've seen it over and over again, even my patients now that I've, you know, been in one place long enough to see the, the trajectory of someone, it's just like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. It just speeds up. So I'm kind of like, I don't think I'm ever retiring. It's just. <laughs> no, no, you just got to choose your, choose your stress-free patients at that time, you know? 
<laughs> you know it, you know it. So let's talk about, let's talk about this concept, like that you get to a plateau. We already talked about that. You, we fit in why you don't believe in it, how you got those two weeks and you figure things out. And then we've got a lot of folks who'll just be like, screw it. I'm going for like gastric bypass or screw it. I'm going to get the semaglutide out and I'm going to, I'm going to start that and see if that can help me. What's, what's kind of your statement there when, when we, or what can happen when someone does those sorts of things? I know that semaglutide and gastric bypass are very different, but I'll let you kind of take it from there. So you got to think it, it's changing the perspective and we have a very short-sighted goal perspective here in the United States. So it's the, I want it now, instant gratitude, all that. And the problem is it usually isn't the right choice, right? And, and I'll, I'll paraphrase a story. It'll it'll make a bit more sense. But like, let's say your neighbor's out like water in the dirt, planting a plant, and all of a sudden it's growing, right? And you're like, wow, they're such a good gardener. And then your other neighbor across the street is planting water and dirt, and he's doing it for yeah three years. And you're like, John, what are you doing? Like, oh, I'm watering my Chinese bamboo tree. And you're like, John, you've been watering dirt for three years, buddy, like, Cindy over here has already got like a six foot pear tree. Like, what are you, what are you doing, man? I'm watering my Chinese bamboo tree. I'm like, that's dirt. What, what are you doing? But what people can't see is the whole time that thing has grown roots. And once it finally breaks the surface, you know, X amount of years later, it grows like six to nine feet a day. So even though like you look at Cindy's and you're like, wow, she's making great progress in the short term, it's not the long term progress that you would see. And so it's a band aid over a stitch wound. And so for some people, like you said, okay, if you're six, 700 pounds, you can't stop eating. Okay. It's time to button that stomach up because that's your only option, right? Because you're basically going to die if you don't do this. Now in the peptide situation, the semi-glutides, ozempics, all, all these things, and the gastric bypass, these are crutches. And so what these are is, unfortunately, I think there's a bit of a money drive to it because doctors will make money prescribing things, surgeries and all that. 99% of the people that get them, I do not think need them. Also, if you're on the flip side, if you sit where I do, you're going to see how many people get the wicked backlash from it. The 30, 40% of people that get these done that rebound the weight that they put on, even after gastric bypass, even after Ozempic, even after all this stuff. Because what you never did was you never fixed the problem. Mm -hmm. So if your problem was cocaine and you're, you got locked in a rehab center, well, there's no cocaine that you have access to. So of course you're sober, but then we put you right back in your house and you lived with your drug dealer. Do you think you still quit cocaine? Probably not. And this is why Alcoholics Anonymous have a 90% failure rate. This is why rehab institutions have 90 plus percent failure rate because no one ever changes the environment. And so the problem is Ozempic, um, gastro bypass, you never change the environment. You never told them that eating McDonald's was bad. You told them, cool, we're just going to eat less McDonald's, which will work from a weight loss perspective, but it will not work from a health and a body composition perspective because simply put, you're just eating less garbage because you can't physically fit it. So the minute you stretch your stomach out or you come off Ozempic, guess what happens? That weight comes flying back up. Now the problem is because of what you've done, you literally have to work it off because there's no way at this point you can train your met metabolism to get better other than adding muscle and your ability to consume calories is so minimal. You're gonna have to work three, four, five times as hard as you ever would have simply doing it the right path in the first place. So hard. And and it's so hard to convince someone mm -hmm. of that, especially now with the Ozempic and how it's been and put out there. Unfortunately, what I'm seeing, and, and I don't know if you've seen, seen this mm -hmm. too, some folks that are trying to lean out a little bit more, 20, maybe 30 pounds to lose mm -hmm. are trying to get into those um, injections as well. Have you seen that in, in your- Oh, across, across the board across the board and it's it's awful so like it's getting prescribed for anyone that's coming in there like oh i can't lose weight so instead of focusing on anything like hey have you tried eating more protein or hey have you tried exercising they go oh well here try this drug and that's like the fourth thing down on the sequence right like you check the nutrition you check the training you check the activity you check the hormones and then if all those are in check we go, okay, ah, the body's probably a little stubborn. Maybe we need a little extra help. And that's when, when you would potentially look at stuff like this. 
So the, even the, the mechanisms itself, uh, it's a, and I'm, I'm going to butcher the word here, ghrelin, I believe is how you pronounce it, the hormone. Ghrelin, ghrelin. Ghrelin, yes, that one. So doctor, doctor speak, I just read them all day, right? So with this, that is your hormone that tells you to eat. So Ozempic suppresses this. So you're suppressing appetite and it slows gastric release. This is also where a lot of its side effects come in, but just from a basic, it slows gastric release. So in a nutshell, the, uh, your basic person could mimic these results by drinking apple cider vinegar with their meals and eating 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal. And I guarantee you would dump more weight than Ozempic doing that. Because simply put, that's going to give you the same output outputs with a muscle preserving tendency, because now you have the, enough protein to actually keep the muscle. So you're not going to look like this saggy, deflated skin person, because if you know anyone that's on Ozempic, they look gaunt. They look like they're starving. They're malnourished. And so they drop weight, but there's never muscle tone or definition. And I, I, I don't know a single person, even if they tell me they want weight loss, that actually means weight loss. They all mean fat loss. Right. And so nothing in those preserves it. So the problem with those Empic is because you don't learn the habits, you don't learn the lifestyles, you are going to gain the weight back with a vengeance when you're done. So if you look at even the clinical data they have, there's a 90% weight gain rate, once stop, once stop. So only 10% of the people that actually lose weight on it are going to keep that weight up. And I would imagine that's a overinflated. That's probably just a 10% that didn't check back in with them. But off the data, 90% of the people gain it back when you come off. So ask yourself, do you want to be on that for the rest of your life? If the answer is no, you probably need a different plan. Now, gastric bypass is much, 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 much worse in my opinion. Now, I am not a Zimbic fan, but this one is permanent. Yeah. And the problem with this one, I'm sure you've seen it too, but I've had people that get gastric bypass. They'll dump 50, 100 pounds, 200 pounds, cool. And all of a sudden it goes, thunk, stops, hangs out maybe two, three months, maybe a year, and then it starts going. Now, the, fun the funny thing is these people can't actually eat. So now even when they're eating, they're stuffing their face and eating, you know, 15, 1700 calories, right? In extreme discomfort because how much they're pushing that stomach capacity, but what happens is you lose weight essentially off the third principle. So because you're dropping it so fast, it's never body fat. It's a third fat, third water, third muscle. So I had a gal, super, super sweet. I'll leave her name out of this, but she was a client originally, you know, 10 plus years ago doing tire flips, super strong, running marathons. She was a bigger gal, had gained weight over the years, right? So she got frustrated, ended up doing gas right fast. Anyways, drops, you know, back down to under 200 where we've had her pretty close to before, right? Cool. I'm not going to, you know, shun somebody for it, right? What's done is done. We'll just find the best path forward. So anyways, I get her back up in the gym. This is when I was doing in-person. And again, this is a guy who's flipping tires, leg pressing 600 pounds, like all this stuff while losing weight. And she can't even do 90 pounds with both feet on the cable leg press. She had lost so much muscle in that process. And the thing is the calorie intake, she can't gain it back. She, she doesn't have the ability to eat enough protein on top of everything else to actually gain anywhere near the muscle she has. So that muscle is your metabolism, guys. So you strip that muscle off over time and your metabolism is going slower and slower and slower. So that's why initially from like gas right past, you're like, wow, 50 pounds off, 30, 20, 10. And it slows down because every pound of muscle you're losing, it's less and less burn. And so the body not only adapts to the new calories, because you got to think like, if the body didn't adapt, it would just die when you did gastro bypass. It's going, oh, well, not enough. I'm going to starve to death. So it goes, whoo, I'm not getting my 3,000 no more. I think, okay, I got to learn how to live with 1,000. Let's see how we do this. And so it does. It's like a tortured prisoner. And so the thing is, it's going to do anything it can to survive. Prisoners don't look good, right? They're not high functioning, but they're alive, right? And that's essentially what your body is at that point. It's just functioning. It's doing the basic it needs to, to get things done. So if you look, your output probably goes down, your step counts probably through the floor, you have no energy, you're not moving around very well. You initially feel better, you have a little more pep in your step because you're lighter, but you've lost so much muscle, the, the longevity of it is not there. And so the downside is the only way to build a metabolism is to increase the intake of food. But how do you increase intake when you don't have capacity? Very, very challenging to do. And likewise, they're so paranoid about gaining weight. That's why they got the surgery. They don't want to see it even tick up. 
Right. And so you have to be able to like a bow and arrow, right? You got to be able to pull it back. So we get some momentum forward and that scale may have to go up for a little bit while you actually get that metabolism, a little bit of a breather and attempt to get it burning. So you can actually finish out the fat loss and most importantly, finish trying to gain some muscle back. So you can actually have muscle definition and muscle tone before that scale starts creeping back up for your, from your extremely impaired metabolism. Yeah. Oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. And, and I mean, even just kind of this, the same trajectory gap, you know, independent of gastric bypass, I feel like a lot of women kind of put themselves on a gastric bypass diet anyway, you know, without the, the surgery, cause they'll start taking down their calories. And it's so common. And I'm sure you've probably seen this too, is a lot of women just seem to not want protein as they get yeah. older. And, and I know it has a lot to do with digestion, myself included. I've had some issues over the years. But I see that being like yeah. such a issue. Well, when, when you're talking digestion too, it's not uncommon because doctors over prescribe antacids and acid is what breaks down the protein. So you mix the fact we're over prescribed those. We get decrease in stomach acidity with age, which leads to permeable guts, leaky guts, all this stuff. So, you know, if you're over 30, there's a high chance you probably need to be taking some like betaine HCL plus pepsin with like lunch and dinner or one of those meals that's heavier protein. Because if you're noticing that protein set heavy, it probably just is the acidity of your stomach's too low to digest it. Mm -hmm. And so if we can crank the acidity up on that, all of a sudden the protein doesn't set as heavy, you'll be full, but not like you ate a brick. And so now we'll get better utilization, better, better all that out of it. And once we do that, we're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that was a game changer for me because I got to a point like the same thing, like the protein just sit and I'd be like, Oh, and I see it happen like as a slow thing to a lot yeah. of women where they're not really realizing like it's digestion. They're just like, no, I feel like I just want more carbs lately. Or, you know, and it's like, yeah. no, nah, it's it's because your body's like, I need to eat something. Well, um, and carbs don't take like they don't take the acidity to break down. That's why you can just eat them and you feel great. You know, proteins and even fats take quite a bit more as far as digestive work to, to actually use. And so, yeah, in that point right there, if you do notice yourself gravitating more towards carbs, maybe you need to look at how can I increase the acidity levels in my stomach to help digest this food. And then you can start shifting those gears, really getting that composition you're looking for. Huge, huge point. How long have you seen on average when someone shifts their diet? to start eating more protein to, and, and like you said, you might see the weight go up at first. How long on average do you see it take to kind of shift it, to get the metabolism back fired up? Because I see all kinds of things online in terms of what is real, but I'd like to hear from like, what have you seen over time? In your it's, it's honestly usually really, really quick. Now, if you're someone who had a a lot of the inputs correct at first, like, okay, you're training five days a week, eating, you know, whatever, 80 to hundred grams of protein. It's not going to be quite as drastic, but basically when I bring someone on, especially from a female perspective, most of them are not training or training near as intense as they should. So right. we get this initial tick up in muscle, but the fat loss should still be going down if the diet is composed for. So with that, the muscle gain is usually faster than the fat loss. So what happens is we'll tick up on the scale two, four, maybe six weeks maximum. But this is why having multiple things to watch when it comes to your fat loss is key. Because if we only watch the scale, your goal is not to look good on scale. Like you think if you went on a date, no one's ever been like, hey, I think you look amazing, but please step on this so I'll tell you, right? <laughs> Never has that happened. So they look at you go, damn, or oh, maybe there's room for improvement, right? So from a visual, we're the only ones that care about the scale. So when we take it out of context, right? Let's say you start out, you were 150 on Monday, you started your new, your program, you're 152 at the end of the week. Most girls would be like, ah, this plan isn't working. Ah, what do I do? Well, I like to think of, that's two of these, of water, right? I wouldn't panic if I drank two glasses of water and got on that scale. Well, okay, yeah, check. We got more water in the muscles. They're 80% fluid, that's bound. But this is where you can get kind of a, a point of reference. Pictures are good for coaches, because we have a different discrepancy with it, right? You're emotionally attached to you. So you're going to nitpick them apart and you're probably not going to see it until it's a very drastic change. Now, one thing you can't deny in the driver's seat is tape measures. Okay. So if you start out and your waist is whatever, 35 inches and end of the week, it's 34 and a half. I do not care if you're up five pounds. We're trending the right way. Everything's going down. Perfect. 
So what will happen is, cool, I've gained muscle, which is going to help me for the long term, and I'm losing fat. I'm going to ride this out. Because at the end of the day, we're not chasing a scale, right? We're chasing a look. And if we can get that look there, perfect. So make sure you have your other measurables. I measure the waist at the belly button, the waist at the small part, and the biggest area of the glutes. Those are the three. You can measure arms, legs, hips, all the other stuff. But those three are the ones that are going to tell the story. Take pictures, right? But do it every two, two, three weeks, right? Any sooner than that, it's going to look the same. Make sure you have the same lighting, same place, same location. Don't change anything when it comes to that. You got to have consistent variables. And then the scale, make sure you're weighing at consistent times. Don't wait at night. It's going to fluctuate too much. Get it first thing in the morning. You wake up after you use the restroom. Cool, right? You pick two days a week. Monday, Friday, Monday, Thursday, Monday, Saturday. doesn't matter. Compare Mondays to Mondays. Compare Fridays to Fridays. Mm. I like Mondays and Fridays because normally people are good Monday through Friday. Then the weekend comes to get a little looser, right? And then they get on the scale and they're like, time up from Friday. But maybe it's down a half a pound from the previous Monday. So is it really up? No, when we look at the right data, right? So then when we compare Friday, if I was down a half pound here, I should be down at least a half a pound by Friday. If I'm not, okay, maybe the measurements are on point. Cool. If both those are the same, eh, any time to pump the gas yet, maybe I'm going to ride this out of the week, make sure I'm completely consistent. You know, I didn't grab an extra couple of snacks at work. I got all my steps in, et cetera. And if it's been two weeks that I go, ah, okay, maybe... I need to button up the food a little bit. Maybe I need to push the intensity on the training. Maybe I need to crank my step count a little bit. Then you can start playing with the variables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Jake and Steph from Troop Functional Mushrooms have given you a little gift for listening to this podcast. If you enter Health Fix 20, you can get 20% off your order of Troop Functional Mushrooms. All right, let's get back to the podcast. So much, so much to think about, which is why I do recommend having a coach because I think it just helps streamline everything for everyone. Because, I, you know, even myself, yeah, I've been doing this for a long time, but I feel like there are things where you miss, right? You miss certain components of things. Yeah. Well, you're too in the weeds with it, right? So you go, like with your client stuff, you'll go, oh, my client Jan, what, this is what she needs. And then it's the same thing for you. And you're like, oh, but should I do 32 carbs instead of 30? Uh, is it 40 protein or is it 37? Like, ooh, I do I? And it's just overthinking, right? Because none of that's going to matter. And you would never do it with any of your clients. You're like, this is what she needs. Cool. But when there's that emotional component, very few people can step out of that and do their own stuff. Like I, I did bodybuilding stuff. I trained, trained myself for, you know, 12 years in it. But I can count on one hand how many other coaches that I knew that did that. Because even though they could get people in amazing shape, they still had to hire someone to get themselves in shape because they couldn't take that emotional component out of it to put together a logic-based plan. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's all overthink anything. Like, God. So, no, it makes sense. It makes sense. And it's something I wanted folks to hear because sometimes we'll just be like, I could do it myself. Yeah, you could, but are you doing it right now? Yeah. Well, and the other thing on that too, like you could, but what you're going to get, it's the time. So you're either going to pay it with some money or you're going to pay it with some time. So any one of us has been doing this with massive amounts of time in, we have a couple of variables. When we work with people, we get even more accelerated information. So it's not just me over the last 20 years. It's me plus 40, 55, 50, 60 clients a month for years. So, you know, when you combine that amount of knowledge, like, yes, I cannot tell you what having a period feels like shocker. However, I have had so many clients that have a period. I'm very familiar with what it does to the scale, the bloat, the cravings, and all of the above. And so that's that's the beauty of having a coach because anyone that's put the time in, they've probably worked with someone in a very similar situation to where you're at, where you can just put, put that on hyperspeed when it comes to results rather than having to go out and do the learning curve where, yeah, like we're saying, you can try this stuff out for two weeks, make adjustments. But man, if you could just get it right off the gate, imagine how much quicker you could reach your end goal. Mm hmm mm hmm Huge. Huge. So speaking about reaching end goals and the whole concept of folks thinking, I can never eat this again. I can never eat that again. And you had mentioned, you know, yeah. you can still eat pizza three yeah. times a week and keep your look. And then, and when we first talked, you had talked about even just going to Costco and like mixing things up and being yeah. able to still even go through the drive-through. Yeah. Um, 
And and this is what intrigued me about you because, you know, a lot of folks are going to be very pure and be like, no, you can only eat organic, you know, and, and closest to nature. And of course that helps, but yeah. I love pizza too. And, <laughs> and, and it doesn't so, grow out of the ground. <laughs> right. Right. And, and unfortunately, yeah, I mean, we, we have to think about these things. So tell us how, how you can get away with eating pizza three times a week and keep up your look. Cause I'd really like to know. Yeah. So step one, all of this is dependent on being leaner, right? So you have to get lean first. Higher body fat bodies do not cooperate. There's wicked spillover. They don't utilize nutrients as well. It's just an assortment of problems. So you do got to put your time in. So I'll preface with that, right? You can't just start out like I'm 35% body fat. Cool. Three pizzas a week. You're not to that point, but get there. And then you open up the ticket to freedom home because maintenance is remarkably easier than getting there. And so what you want to do is focus on leaning down first since the lean bodies are optimized. Once you get there, you know, like midsection looks good for ladies, more flat for guys. You want some visible abs. That's a good benchmark for like, cool. I'm probably lean enough to make this happen. Then what you want to do is try to build your metabolism up over time. But here's the thing. As you start to put on more muscle, muscle burns calories. And this is where it comes in. So if you can put on that extra muscle, you burn a boatload of calories. So when I would do bodybuilding shows, I remember I would be backstage at the show and the other bodybuilders got their chicken and rice backstage, right? They're eating this. They're like, I can't wait to get done with the show and I'm going to go eat X, Y, Z. And this is why you'll see a lot of those guys, if you're in the fitness industry, you're like, man, I look so good after the show. Huh, shocker. Because you ate the food you should have before the show, after the show. And so what, what I would do that was a little different, I would wait till I was depleted, which... You'll have biomarkers for that, right? A little bit in the weeds, but basically like when your glycogen levels, your stored carbs run out, workouts hit the flat wall. So you have AT ATP, CP, glycolic, aerobic. So we'll throw aerobic out. It's irrelevant for training, right? So we have ATP, CP, adenosine, triphosphate, creatine, phosphate, phase one. Think roughly six repetitions. Then glycolic, car carb phase, okay, eight, 12, maybe up to 15, maybe 20. And then it goes into aerobic, right? So for strength training, we focus on the first two. We can't be in this first phase or out of this first phase into the second unless we have carbohydrates in. So if you're on keto, carnivore, any of that stuff, this phase actually does not apply to you because you don't have anything in reserve unless you're eating enough protein to go into glucose, right? So again, a little bit in the weeds here, but going into it, because if we can, if we can read when we are trying to switch that phase and that tank's empty, you know, when your body needs food. And if you know when your body needs food, you can load it with the right time in excessive amounts and have that food be beneficial. So you like pizza, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you like pizza and it actually sped up your fat loss and increased your muscle gain, how much more would you like it? I would love it. And that <laughs> is where we get this, because if we can ride you out till you're depleted, your average person is going to hold three to 400 grams of glycogen, stored carbohydrates. These hold four grams of water per molecule. So basically in a nutshell, if you have 400, you have uh, 1600 grams of water to that, you have 2000 grams, two, uh, 454 grams in a pound, you have four to five grams of glycogen water over your whole body. So even if the scale goes up from being full, it's not fat, it looks better. So basically if you were tracking your strength, what you'd wanna do is you wait till you're at a point of depletion. So it looked like, you know, if you're on the bench press, you're like five, six, <laughs> And it's just done. You're like, well, what the hell? Like it was going so good. And then everything in that workout does the same thing. Because again, ATP, CP, you still have creatine phosphate, right? You still have this short duration. But when that runs out, it's like those old school trucks with the diesel tanks. You go to go to tank two and there's nothing in it. The carb tank's empty. So you're like, Ugh. and so you read that, that workout. And if that whole workout's going like that, and going like just dog crap, cool. It's time to eat. Now, here's the thing your body is going to prioritize shuttling glucose into muscles before it prioritizes burning or storing fat for fuel. So all this food you eat after the window has a very low likelihood to go to store body fat and a very high likelihood to go into muscle tissue when you do this correctly. So like someone like you, if you got depleted, say you were dieting with like 1500 calories, I would tell you to go out and eat three to 4,000 calories. And you'd be like, dude, I'm dieting. No, 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 no. I'm like, mm, cool. And if you do it right, what happens the next day, you're actually lighter. And you're like, what, dude, how did I eat pizza and ice cream? And I'm lighter. Like, cool. Best case scenario, right? You're lighter. Second best case scenario, you're the same. Expected, I would expect you to be up just so we have weight in your gut that hasn't digested yet. 
So right. what you'll do is by day two or three, you're probably identical to the weight that you were on your depletion again. And this tells us we're on pace, right? So when you do this, you can actually stoke the fat loss, stoke the fire, build that up. And now you're getting your favorite foods in far excess of what you thought you'd do while you diet. Flip side, when it goes to maintenance, it's kind of the same thing. So when you notice that tank start to run out, because it will, right? You're not in a surplus. You do the same principle. But at this point, you've increased those calories so much that you actually need to get more calories from something so you don't start stripping muscle. So, okay, maybe we, we got you up. You're burning 2,500, 3,000 calories a day. You get behind, you get busy at work. You're at like 1,500 and it's it's six o'clock at night. Well, what do you do? You have a protein shake, go to bed? No, dude, you need what? You need 2,000 calories. That's three quarters of a large pizza. So you need to actually go eat that pizza just to check the numbers we need to maintain the muscle mass that you have. And it doesn't care if it's chicken, rice, broccoli, any of that. It's a numbers game, right? And so this is how you do it. So if you can use that strategy when you're lean, it gives you kind of some short-term stuff in the middle. And then when you lose it, use it when you're going through that building phase and going into maintenance, that's where you can just juggle calories more to fit because you blasted that metabolism, metabolism up so high, you have a lot more leeway to do so. Wow. That's cool. I think for a lot of people right now, they might be thinking like, all right, Cody, so how does this look in terms of a training block and how yeah. does this look? Cause obviously we've got to get lean first. And, yeah. and when you say lean, yeah. you know, like, I think for body fat percentage, a lot of folks will be thinking, are we going body fat percentage? Are we looking at, what are we looking at? Yeah. Yeah. So body fat percentage would be good. I, I prefer the visuals though. So if you're a male, you have visible abs, you're most likely between like 10 and 13%. Okay. Which that's a good word. Good spot. The leaner you can get the, the more muscle we can remit, right? But that's a good percentage to do it. For ladies, a flat stomach. So usually like 16 to 20, depending on how you hold it. Because also with ladies, you're not going to blast as quick. Like you're, you're not like, oh, I want to put on 30 pounds of muscle this year. You're like, if I see that scale go up 30 pounds, I'm going to lose it. So like, it's a little bit more gradual. And so what we want to do when we're on the up, once we get lean is, is play it like a, like building a campfire, right? So when you're building a campfire, what do you do? You don't grab all the wood and come over and go boom and snuff it out. Right. And that's what it would be like where people take these drastic swings up in calories. It's too much. The body can only store at that point. Pound of muscle is roughly 600 calories. Pound of fat is 3,500. It does not take a lot to put on more muscle. So we have to play it a little bit more strategically. So let's just take numbers, for instance, right? Okay, cool. You're down to like 16, 18% looking good. 1,500 calories. You're like, Cody, I want to I crank my metabolism. What do we do? Okay, cool. Step one, are you comfortable with the amount of cardio you're doing right now? And if you're like, dude, I hate, I hate how much I have to do. Cool. So what we're going to do, you're in an hour a day. Cool. Let's take 20 minutes off that this first week and let's add a hundred more calories. in. You're like, but that's not that much. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. It's not that much. Cool. You know, but, but I want to cool. Yep. We'll talk, talk to me in six months. Okay. So cool. We do this. So now we've increased our calories and we've decreased our output, giving us roughly 150 ish calories a week. That's usually the number I like to play for a slower duration. Right. So then what you do is you weigh Friday, weigh or Monday, Friday, weigh the next week. Also, the next week, you're like, dude, I weigh 150 again on the button. Cool. Worked. Now let's do it again. So let's maybe shave 10, 15, 20 more minutes off the treadmill. Let's add another 100 calories in, see what happens. Cool. Weight ticked up a little bit. That's what it should do. Cool. We're up 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Cool. We're going to ride that out. So then when the weight stops, to starts to stall for a week or two, or it goes down when you're trying to increase, that's your cue. When it goes down, I'm going to eat a cheat meal. And then I'm going to restart the cycle, right? Go up another hundred, decrease cardio. If your cardio is like, cool, I love the amount I'm doing. Cool. Stop decreasing cardio. Go up hundred to 150 calories a week. Play that Monday, Friday. If you're consistent, cool. It's the same. Cool. You're in maintenance. If you like the calories you're at, don't change anything. If you're like, I want to try to push it. Cool. Throw in another hundred, 150. Stays the same. It goes up. Cool. Right. And you ride it like that. So it's a process, right? It's a, it'll lose you a little bit of interest, intricacy to watch it. And then this is where you track with waste and progress pictures mm. and so like I've, I've done this with hundreds of people right and usually i have to talk them off a cliff because the girl she's like oh my god i look so amazing then she gets on the scale and she's like oh my god i'm so fat now right and she was looking amazing three minutes before but here's the thing i've had girls that i put on 30 pounds on their frame okay 30 and their waist is the same as where it started 
Now I ask you this, how fat can you be when your waist is the same as you start? And like not saying they didn't sneak on some fat, but like some fat in the right places looks really good when it's there, right? So the fact that they're not Buddha bellying out, like that is the perfect situation. So when you're going up, likewise, you want to track the same things you track when you're going down. You track your measurements, you track your weight, and you track with pictures. When you're going up, you will not see progress in the pictures. And you're like, what, what, what do you mean? That's why I'm taking progress pictures. Progress pictures when you're going up, your goal is to look the same. And you're like, well, that's dumb. There's no perception, right? So if you had like your little chihuahua sitting next to you, you could see if you're bigger or but by yourself, it's isolated. There's nothing to compare it to. So if you're growing that body equally, how are you going to look any different if you're keeping the body fat relatively the same? You're not. And so you're just going to see that I weigh 10 pounds more and I look the same. I weigh 10 pounds more and I look the same. That's good because it means your body fat visually hasn't went up that much. Now, if you went up 10 pounds and it looks like you have a belly, maybe your approach was off. Maybe you did it too soon. Maybe you were too aggressive with it. Maybe something's off hormonally, right? Where you can't put on muscle that quick. Something was off on it, but it may be time to rethink your approach. And, or if you weren't lean enough, get that where you're dieted down to where it's actually applicable. But those would be the metrics I watch with it. And you want to track this stuff weekly because this stuff is subtle, right? You won't see it over time, but what you're going to see is when you zoom out, you're going to be like, oh my God, <laughs> I have made progress. That's amazing. And when you can do it like that, that is the secret to success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's huge. That's huge. That's great for folks to hear that. And and obviously everyone has a different time frame in which that they'll they'll get to that. But it does seem like it's possible to get a lot leaner within six to eight weeks, if not. Yeah. Well, and it's a numbers game too, right? So if you're a lady and you're at like 25% body fat at 150 you got to lose 7% body fat to get roughly in that range. So that's 10 and a half pounds of fat. So that means you get down to 139 and a half, don't lose any muscle. Check you're there. One yeah. pound a week, 10 weeks, right? That's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. And so when you break it down, it's not as bad. So when we look at like 10 pounds to go, we're like, oh my God, I have to lose 10 pounds. We were like, can you lose one this week, Jan? And she's like, yeah. What about you, Cindy? Can you lose one? Yeah, I definitely can lose one. Can you lose 10? Oh, no, 10 is too much. I can't lose that. It's so hard. Okay, cool. Well, let's take it one at a time. And before you know it, you're down 10, and then we're at our goal, right? And that's how it's done. But it's the subtleties, right? So where I think most people make the biggest mistake trying to do this is because their approach is too drastic and too extreme. So what happens is they get done, they have such a bad taste in their mouth about dieting, right? They're, they're on carnivore keto, they've avoided every form of carbohydrate, they're on vegan, they've avoided every form of meat, they're on XYZ, right? They've avoided so much when they get done, they go, check, I beat fitness, I'm having everything I didn't have. So it goes, right. bloop, because here's the thing, guys, when you try to throw in just 100 calories more a day, it's not a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's like, just to put it in context, that's like you had one tablespoon of peanut butter more a week you're not going to be full you're not going to be like oh my god my appetite is quenched no you're going to be hungry and as you start putting more food in your body's going oh she's feeding us okay let's get a little bit more and it's going to try for it right so you got to keep really good mental fortitude while you go through this process and then i always recommend getting to a point where a you love how the body looks and feels but also where you hate your food intake and you're like whoa hang on wait, i hate your food intake I want people eating so much food. They're like, Cody, please do not bump my food up again. Because when they say that, I know they will never get fat again because they, they literally cannot eat enough to gain the body, body fat. Back. And this is when I know I'm going to have long-term success with a client because they would have to go off the deep end to undo what we did during the process. That's incredible. And, and that's something that I think a lot of people don't get to ever unless they've had a plan laid out like that. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it's a process, right? So like you got to be able to see where you're going, but you, you almost have to have somebody see it for you because we don't tend to believe in ourselves enough to actually get there. Right. You know, we're like, Oh, this would be, it'll be good. If I get there, I'm like, if, <laughs> Hey, it's when, and what is the juicy goal? Like if we had a magic wand, that's the goal you want to aim for. It doesn't matter if you think you can do it or you think you can't, that is beyond this pick the goal you actually want. So when you get it, it's everything you wanted to be, right? Don't, don't settle short on the goal. Like that's your job to pick it. You can figure out the, the what's the why's, the how's, all that stuff later. 
but you gotta you gotta figure out the what you actually want off the gate, and then you can carve a path out on how to attain it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think for a lot of people, unfortunately, it's it's just the idea of fat loss, right? Or maybe they have a vision of what the they want the body to look like. And I want people to think more on like strength than, you know, all the other. Well, the other thing I see, I love strength, but I don't like to be paralyzed in it too, because there's <laughs> one downside I see to it. So for a lot of ladies, it's like, and I, I'm like, no offense to power lifters or anything like that, but power lifting is where body compositions go to die. <laughs> so you'll see some heavy ladies starting out, right? They try to lose weight, try to lose weight, try to lose weight. It doesn't work. So they say, well, I just want to be strong. Right. But that's not why Cindy started lifting. She started lifting because she wanted to be, you know, she wanted to be comfortable in a swimsuit like her body. So then they shift the narrative to like, I'll just get strong. And so what it is was you had the right goal initially, but you didn't have the right approach. So you gave up on it because you couldn't find the path. And then you went with a path where by default you could win, which yeah. is not really winning at that point, right? Like you went with the, the path of least resistance Whereas really you just needed to redirect your path the first way to get it because yeah, you might be happy being strong, but I guarantee like if you go down to Florida and it's swimsuit time, you're not happy because you could deadlift 400 pounds. You're like, Oh, it's the beach. Uh, maybe we'll go down to this section where there's not a bunch of little teenagers in good shape. Right. And like, I want people to feel like Stevie wonder picking a swimsuit, right? Like it doesn't matter what you're wearing. You're like, I'm gonna look damn good in this. I know, I know this. And that's when you've truly hit a point where you're at results that you can enjoy, right? And that's where everyone deserves to be, but you got to have the right approach to get it. So A, first and foremost, guys, don't give up on your goals. Like if you set a goal out for body composition, don't shift the narrative to like, well, I guess 400 dead, pound deadlift's cool enough. No, 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 go for body composition. And then if you want to deadlift 400 pounds, cool, do that Do that in the meantime. But don't do it in, instead of the goal that you really set out for. That's sage advice. I mean, it really is because I, I do see that happen quite often. I do see that happen quite often. And I, I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't in that category multiple times in my life because I think I was born with like, the, the ability to gain muscle, not a problem for me. Yeah. Ability to lose the fat, not so, you know, it's 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 one of those things, right? It takes work. Yeah. But yeah, you know, it's it is a thing. And 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 it is common it is common when you go to a powerlifting competition body fat percentages are not always in the big, big people are strong you know <laughs> and so you got that farm strength but you got a little bit of weight to you you know I, I came from powerlifting so the first meet I went to I was probably the only one there with abs yeah and it just it wasn't what I was expecting yeah. because in my head I'm like you know thinking like Arnold's and things like that right and then I get there and I'm like Ah, like these guys look like they could have won some eating contests, you know, like they were some big, big individuals, strong, but they didn't look strong. Right. And so right. for me, I'm like, I would rather look strong and be kind of strong than be really strong. And pe you have to prove what you can actually lift to people. Whereas I could tell somebody I bench press 500 pounds. They'd look at me and go, yeah, he probably can. I'm like, yeah, I can't, I, I can't touch that, but <laughs> I look like I can. <laughs> and so that's, that's the life I like to go with it. But yeah, you can't, you can't give up on the goals you initially set, right? Even if you hit some obstacles, hit some resistance, it's time to redirect, right? And find another path there because you're not, you're not unique in the fact that you can't reach your goal, right? What it is is you don't have the right information to move that needle forward. And as soon as you plug that right information in, then you can carve your path to success. Let's tell folks how they hook up with you. How do you, how does it work? What do they do? So if you're someone who's interested, uh, DM me on Instagram. So just DM me coach 33. If you're interested in getting, getting started or, and we're not going to push it down your throat, right? Let's make sure you're a fit for what I do. And if we are cool, I'll go through everything with you. But like I said, if you're out there, you're feeling stuck, there's a path to success, right? So you send me coach 33 on Instagram, Facebook at Cody Watkins Fitness. Pretty easy to find on there. Um, I can carve out the path for success. Basically, when I bring someone on, we go through a consult call. That's free. If what I do is a fit, I'd love to have you on board. If not, you're going to learn everything about what we would do to start you out. So you're going to come out with some good information regardless. And we shake hands on the internet and part of ways, friends, right? I'm not pushing anything down anyone's throat. 
I only want people on my team that want to be there. And if you're not someone who wants to be there, I'm not going to force you to slide your card, right? That's not for me. <laughs> no, no, no. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. All right. So we're going to put that in to the podcast notes, of course, folks, on how you can reach Cody on Instagram and it's coach 33, correct? I got that. All right. DMing coach 33. We'll write that down. Whew, man, Cody and I got long winded on this one. So we split this podcast into two episodes. So if you're wondering Cody's best method of checking body fat and a little more details on weight loss and more, stay tuned. Next podcast is Cody round two. All right. Hey, fellow health junkie, thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoy tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening. Thanks for listening.